two, one. Okay. Hi guys. Today we are here uh, with the CEO. Is it CEO and founder? What is the official title, by the way? Uh, actually, Jen, thank you very much for having me. The official title is one of the guys. One of the gang. One of the guys from Hassel. Marshall, who the hell are you? Uh, so I am one of the guys from Hassel. I, I was up until about a week ago the CEO and co-founder, but I just decided that for me and for what the stage we're at, that title was a little bit pretentious, so I've dropped it. Um, so I'm one of the guys. So Parcel is a crowdsourced delivery service where we get regular people to do deliveries on their way home in exchange for 10 bucks. Um, where are we? Um, currently, I'm sitting in Frankston in Melbourne in Victoria in a place I'm called the Frankston. You're very hipster. D sorry? Looking hipster. Very hipster. I've, got my, I've got my startup uh, sleepless vest on, so... Um, which wasn't bought in Aldi, but now you can get them in Aldi. Um, where are we? So this, the parcel story, um, my background is 20 years in freight and logistics. Um, I ran a company called My Freight, um, which is basically an enterprise level um, IT platform freight management company where we looked after some of Australia's biggest companies. Um, I got out of that in July 2016 to go and run a company called Email Handyman, which is a corporate email training company. I've got the rights to that in Australia. Um, I did two sessions. And then decided I didn't want to do that because it wasn't really what I wanted to do. Um, I was lucky enough to get into the Founder Institute uh, Summer 2016 program in Melbourne. Um, if you don't know the Founder Institute, it's basically 16 weeks, 50 hours a week of so you really think you want to have a startup. Um, where they took us from everything from idea validation uh, right through to launching a business, marketing, branding, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, if you survive the program which I think six of us did out of 25, um, then there's a, there's a slightly more than 1% chance that we'll have some success down the track. Uh, so I did that. Um, the, yes, fingers crossed. I'm not, yes, success is interesting. Um, so where have I been? So we, what are we now, 16 months in. Um, we officially launched last night. So this is the uh 16th of april last night was the 15th of april um we were lucky enough to get on channel 7 news with a nice puff piece about parcel um and one of our lovely customers pure baby um and talked about that so uh we pretty much spent the last 24 hours onboarding uh customers um, that was a long answer to a short question no it's perfect thank you and so with your model um i mean in one sentence how would you describe it and then like how, how does the model actually work your business models so you pay, pay people ten dollars yeah so basically we just get regular people to do deliveries on their way home from the shopping center so um our passes which is what we call the delivery people are people who've downloaded the app and registered so we know who they are and where they live um and then they've given us the ability to locate them um and then we just keep it when Oh, so that's the parcel side. So that's the delivery side. Yeah. The customer side is the retailer. So our customers are what's called omni-channel retailers, which means they have a physical uh, network of stores and they also have an online presence. Yeah. And we're a ship from store customer. So instead of getting dispatched from the Western, um, from a distribution center in Western Sydney or Western Melbourne, it gets dispatched from the local store. Um, so I'm in Frankston right now. There's a Rebel Sports store. So if someone's shopping online and they live around here, they'll choose a three-hour delivery instead of choosing give it to me in a week with Australia Post. Um, the store then gets it ready in store, and then they send us a message and say, hey, Parcel, we'll get this done. And then all the people that were running around with our app uh, we'll use a bit of predictive um, algorithm to say, okay, we can see that someone's currently at the Frankston Shopping Centre and they're going to be really, really close to this delivery address in a couple of hours' time. Let's see if they want the job. Um, send them a message, they say yes, they go and pick it up from the store, like click and collect, uh, and then they do the delivery on the way home. Fantastic. And so we, what's your current traction? So you're saying you had about 2,000 um, hassle careers? Yeah, so um, our traction, we've basically been in beta mode up until uh, now. Um, we've had Pure Baby um, and a store called Pookie Poiga as our pilot customers in Melbourne and Geelong. We've only done 60 deliveries uh, in the past three months, um, but it was really just figuring out what we were doing. And we did it all without an app. Uh, we were just using some SMS, some guesswork and a few maps. Um, so where we're at right now is we're about to go national with Pure Baby. Uh, so they'll Sydney and Brisbane will roll out this week. Um, in the early, where are we now? Middle of April. Late this month, early next month, we'll roll out a couple more customers, the party people in Sydney um, and a few other ones. 
Um, and I'm talking to a whole bunch of other retailers, but until they actually sign, I'm not going to say anything about it. Uh, yeah, we've got about 2,000 passes. Uh, that's what we call our people. Um, about over 1,000 of them signed up in the last 16 hours once they saw us on Channel 7. Um, and we're hoping to sort of use that um, absolute free advertising that you can't buy um, and really push that out through social and everything over the next few weeks um, with a goal. I'd really like sort of 10 to 15,000 by the end of the month. Um, because it's a crowd, right? The more people we have, the better we're going to be. Um, you asked about the business model. We charge the retailer fifteen dollars uh, and pay the pass to ten. So that's where hopefully we'll make some, you know, what it's surplus revenue. Um, the challenge around that is we guarantee the delivery, so we don't charge if we don't deliver on time. So we really need a big crowd so that we can really lock in that three-hour delivery window. Definitely. And so, how have you actually gotten these, um, tech, I guess, beta users on originally? Uh, the from the customer side or from the customers, sorry. So the customers, so both Pookie Poiga and Pure Baby approached us. Um, I've made a bucket load of noise on LinkedIn and social and whatever else, and um, tried well, to sort so of. I found you. <laughs> well, well, exactly. Yeah, obviously, making enough noise. Um, both of them came to us and said that they both knew. So Pookie Poiga is a gift store, um, and they knew that if they can offer on-demand delivery, they'll sell more because people it's Sunday afternoon and it's your mum's birthday and you've forgotten to buy anything. So they know that if they can deliver it in three hours. Every person's cringing going, I know that story. <laughs> I know that feeling. Oh. <laughs> so do you want a personal standard story? Um, so I've been married for nine years. Um, my wedding anniversary last year, I managed to forget. Um, and um, just, I don't know, this comes from the camera. There's actually a tattoo on my arm with my wedding date on it. And I still forgot our wedding anniversary. Um, just as a side note, Facebook told me on the morning of my wedding anniversary, happy anniversary. Thanks. Is that when you panicked? <laughs> well, that was when I said, that's when I said, sorry, babe. But I'm just saying Facebook should have some sort of algorithm that a week before my wedding anniversary, they send me a message saying, hey, we can see your anniversary is coming up. Um, there's some restaurants you might want to book or some gifts you might want to buy your wife. Yep. They monetize that straight away. That'd be another, that'd restore their bank holes. Anyway, um, I also forgot Valentine's Day, which was the other one. So if Parcel had existed or had it been in a bigger, we would have been able to do it. That's Pookie Poika. The other one's Pure Baby. They're an organic premium uh, babywear store and their customers are expected parents, expectant parents, mothers, and new mums and people who are buying gifts for those people. Um, and they approached us and said, if we can deliver straight away, people think happens, parents panic. My baby's been born and it's not a double zero or a triple zero, whatever the numbers are, it's a different size. And people love giving gifts, but it's hard to book that in advance. Yes. Um, uh, I've got five kids, so I know this. The due date is the date your children won't be born, right? Yes. So you can't, if you want to get something delivered to someone, you've basically got to wait till the baby's born to actually book the delivery. Yeah. Um, traditional couriers are, you know, 35 to 100 bucks for a same day delivery. Um, Australia Post is five to seven days, so you can't do that in advance. So Pure Baby said, if we could get our deliveries done instantly, then we will sell more stuff. And it's proven. So... They supported us through beta, um, and now they've uh, they've asked if we can roll them out nationally in their Brisbane and Sydney stores. That's fantastic. And so, what are the typically the clients going to look like then moving forward? Do you think? It's a really good question. Um, so we know. So it's important. I've only had one retailer in Australia say no. Um, uh, one retailer who I won't mention um, said no because they That's thought that. Asking, <laughs> sorry. Just give us their name and address, it's fine. <laughs> it's, the reason for saying no was they thought that we would overwhelm the click and collect counter in the store. They thought we would be so busy that that might cause congestion within the store. That's a positive. Yeah, but so my background's logistics and I made the mistake early on of pitching this to people who I knew from logistics. Right. And I forgot that people in logistics don't like anything that makes their job harder. So I stopped doing that pretty quickly and just talked to e-commerce people. I talked to people who say, well, someone has to answer for the fact that 70% of their shopping carts are getting abandoned online. Yeah. So it's costing them however much a click, however much to get someone to come to the website, and then they're losing 70% of their revenue there. Mm -hmm. That's the people I talk to now. So what do you think about like customer Afterpay then? Is that like businesses like Afterpay, will that assist you in your conversion rate? Uh, yes, they would. And if anyone from Afterpay is watching this and would love to get in touch with me, you know where to find me. Um, <laughs> Listen, if we can be 10% as successful as Afterpay has been in take-up in retail, I'll be um, ridiculously happy. Um, but, yeah, so Afterpay's pitch, again, is we'll help you sell because when you get to the shopping, the checkout, 
this is a better way to pay than paying by traditional means. Yep. Our pitches were a better way to get your delivery than by traditional means. So um, you said after pay, now I'm thinking about that's the partner with after pay. Um, only one retailer said no. Everyone else has either said, come back to us when you can prove it at scale or come back to us when we can ship from store. So Australian omnichannel retail and the people in the area industry will admit this to you are a little bit behind the rest of the world um, because we had it so good for so long. Are you finding that the Amazon coming into the Australian market has adapted that or adjusting their thought process? I think what Amazon has done is all the people in e-commerce, all my friends in e-commerce who've been trying for the last five years to get someone within their business to listen and say, we've got to get a better online experience, mm. um, but have been stopped by the board who said, can't we just open up some more stores? Um, I think the people in e-commerce, because of the Amazon effect, um, the people, the board saying, what are we doing about Amazon? And these people are now pulling out the documents they've been trying to pitch the last five years saying, this is what we should be doing about Amazon. Yeah. Um, the experience for Amazon is that it's, it's very easy to, to read, read about the retail apocalypse and say Amazon is killing stores. Yeah. Amazon is, kill, is helping stores to die that probably should have died anyway. Stores that don't have a brand identity, stores that didn't have an aggressive e-commerce or omni-channel strategy, stores that didn't love their customer or tell their customer what they stood for. Um, they're the ones that Amazon is sort of picking off because they were going to go anyway. Um, stores that have a really strong brand identity um, can engage with their customers and love their customers. Yeah. They're blossoming. Retail's booming for them. Um, so they're the ones we want. Um, apparel, so particularly women's apparel, shoes, giftware, they're the big three um, that we're targeting. We don't do alcohol, tobacco, firearms, pharmaceuticals or food. Damn. For the first lot, not the food bit. <laughs> so alcohol's really a complex delivery. Um, I'm not confident in... I'm not confident about the alcohol delivery industry because um, I was 18 once. Um, it's very easy to have an adult answer the door and say, yep, yeah, I'll take all this booze and then hand it off to a whole bunch of 16 year olds. I think there's a responsibility thing there. Uh, tobacco, I don't want to kill people. Um, firearms, we don't want to kill people. Um, scheduled pharmaceuticals are potentially problematic, but there's also a thing at the moment in Australia where you have to exchange a physical script for a delivery. Um, and groceries, I don't, want to do, I don't want to do Uber Eats because everyone else is doing it. But groceries are quite heavy and there's also, um, have to, you don't want your ice cream delivered three hours late. Yeah. Um, and we're not an instant delivery service. So we're not, you know, um, it's going to cost you 55 bucks and you have the delivery in five minutes. Yeah. Where it's going to cost you $15 and we'll deliver in the next three hours. Yeah. And what, what about, you know, on Valentine's Day, if you wanted to send, say, a box of donuts or something that don't necessarily need that urgency, but it's like a gift. Yes, so um, we have had discussions with a couple of those sort of companies. Usually that sort of stuff is packaged in a way that it is okay if it doesn't get delivered instantly, um, where it's, um, I, can't, I don't know what the technical term is, but the, oh, insulated, that's the word, um, an insulated bag. So your chocolate might be in an insulated bag or your donuts might be in an insulated bag. Um, we're talking to a company called Giftgram, um, which is a startup about to launch, and their target pretty much is that sort of stuff. Um, flowers is another one where we're talking to flower fox we'll be starting with them pretty soon and yep. um, they're like a marketplace for florists yep. um, flowers are another thing where they don't have to be delivered instantly and the flowers can cope for a while yeah. um, but you don't want to be sort of picking up flowers in the morning and then delivering them at seven o'clock in the evening or anything yeah um, and florists apparently have a real problem getting deliveries done on valentine's day and on mother's day um, well, if you don't look in... <laughs> no so i come from an industry with so anyway it's, if you book in advance, apparently you can get the deliveries done. But if someone who forgot Valentine's Day calls up at 10 o'clock and says, oh crap, I've forgotten Valentine's Day. It's basically come and get them if you can. Um, to actually get that delivered. And all the couriers are booked. Everyone's, yeah. everyone's in the new career on that day. So flowers could be interesting. That could be quite exciting. Yeah. Um, and we'll see what happens. So what, what's the team behind Passel then? How did you guys meet? How did you convince people to kind of get behind you with your vision? You know, how did that all come together? Uh, okay, so the team is me and Julian Kellabora, who's my co-founder. Um, he and I officially are parcel, but then there's about another 50 people who help us out. Yep. Um, in fact, uh, for the party last night, we did a scroll of the thank yous, and it's, um, it's like 20 or 30 slides of people we're thanking. Um, like, there used to be saying it says it takes a village to raise a child, and I'm thinking if it takes a village to raise a child, it takes an entire planet to raise one startup. Um, yep. We're pretty lucky that people have been very generous with their time. Um, a lot of people, if someone says, hey, can you catch up with Marshall for a cup of coffee, we'll catch up with Marshall for a cup of coffee. Um, and then I proceed to go and, you know, um, 
I, I, I proceed to go and allow them to pay it forward yeah. in the hope that at some stage in the future I'm actually successful and I can do the same thing for someone else. Um, so it's me and Julian, um, uh, one of our investors, Ben Bruschella, has been doing a lot of dev work with us as well. Some of the guy, Ray, who's a friend of Ben's, who's been helping out. Then there's Rich, who's a friend of Ray's, who's also a friend of Ben's, who's been helping out. Uh, we've got Rebecca Campbell, who's been doing our social. Um, Beck's a 20-year-old female uni student, so she's right in the target demo for passes, which had 20 to 45-year-old women. Um, she came and said she needed to rescue us from the dad jokes on our Facebook group because that was me running it and I'm a dad. Uh, so Beck's been helping out. Um, our investors, uh, uh, we've got Gavin Stewart, who runs, is the MD of Active Pipe, um, who I've known for about 20 years. Um, he invested in his, in spite of my pitch deck, which at the time was extremely ordinary. I'm not saying it's any better now, but it's just it's better now. Um, but a guy called Niels, who's a supply chain consultant. Um, we got a guy from uh, Circuit Recruitment, so a tech recruitment company, DIN's invested. We've got guys from Adept Project Management who are shop fitters. Um, I don't know, there's, they're called angels for a reason, yeah. right? Like, really, it's... How did, how did you find them all? How did you approach them? How did you pitch them? How did you convince them to believe in you? Or to trust you, essentially? <laughs> so there's one thing that I've got lots of, and that is, like, time. Mm -hmm. um, and you can pretty much always send one more email. Um, so Gavin um, knew me already. Um, he'd already agreed. So he owned a transport company and sold it. So I had a not dissimilar background. I worked in a transport company and then left. Um, but he was sort of an advisor already. And I sent him a copy of the pitch deck saying, I'm going to start talking to investors. What do you think? And he literally wrote back. And he won't mind me telling this. He wrote back and said, no, I'm in for 50 grand. Um, and this is, we're $2 million pre-money valuation at the moment, um, basically based on that's what people keep investing at for no other reason. I've got no metrics that justify that at all. Um, and I don't mind putting that out there because everyone I talked to already knows. Um, so Gavin invested 50 grand. And I called him up because he's a bit of a piss taker. And I said, are you serious? This isn't the time to like, you know, joke because I'm a little bit fragile. And he goes, oh, it's worth a punt. Um, and so he was in. Uh, Niels, I knew previously. Um, uh, ben and Shikan, who are the other investors, are uh, friends of Julian, my co-founder. I've got to tell you the Julian story. I'll finish off on the investors. Um, Din, uh, so circuit recruitment. So at Christmas time, I sent an email that, oh, I've got another friend um, who is a content marketer from the US, um, runs a stack of awesome websites like Job Search Digest, which gets 50,000 hits a day or something. Um, he helped me write an email because he said, Marshall, not so much for you with the writing of the emails, but just try and talk to as many people as you can. So he helped me craft an email, which essentially was to all the people I knew, um, telling them exactly what the story was, exactly where we are, and said, what we need now is some cash. We need some investors so that you can talk to. Um, and out of that, we got another 60 grand of Angel uh, from Dean and from the ADEP guys. Um, that was basically, I sent 350 individual emails between Christmas and New Year. Um, and you can't, I've, look, I've got all the mass marketing tools, I've got MailChimp and whatever else, but everyone knows when they come from those sort of tools. So if you really want, if you really, really want people to talk to you, if I really, really want people to talk to me, I know that I have to sit down and type them an email. Yeah. Um, I know I can copy paste the content in, but the email's got to be from me. It's got to say, hi, Jen, it was really good to catch up with you the other day, blah, 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 as you know, and then you can tell the story. But if you don't have that sort of first couple of lines, if I don't have that first couple of lines, I know people know it's come out of MailChimp or GMAS, um, and it's just another mailer, and it just gets, goes straight to the bin. Yeah. Um, so that's what I did. The Julian story. So Julian used to work at a company called Dias. It's just part of the company that built my freight, the company I used to work for. We met doing that. He's a genius engineer and he's the nicest guy you'll ever meet. We met and we sort of stayed in touch. Um, and about 12 months ago now, I still didn't have a co-founder. So my, I have what they call domain experience, which means I know about the industry, but I don't know anything about tech. And I kept getting told, Marsh, you need a co-founder uh, and you need a tech guy or girl. Um, but then they said, don't rush, because this is like a marriage, because once you've got your co-founder um, and everything's happening, it's really, really hard to get out of. So you've got, you really need a co-founder, but don't rush. So I'm like, I don't even know who to talk to. And so I started talking to people. And then I've got a friend called Ali who runs Zippy Crowd. Um, and I caught up with her for coffee and I was whinging about the fact I didn't have a co-founder. Um, and she said, you already know who the co-founder is. You just don't know. You're not looking for the right person. And so we sat down and in 15 minutes, she found Julian. She goes, well, what about this guy? 
Um, and Julian's like, he's worked at a couple of startups. He's a genius engineer. He used to be a high rise window cleaner. Wow. Like, you know, the people who scaffold off buildings. So he's, he's not risk of it, right? Yeah. Um, and, oh, and he's, he, worked, he, he went through the MAP um, Accelerator, uh, Melbourne Accelerator program. So I dropped him a line and said, would you be interested? We caught up, we had a bit of a chat. And then July, when he came on board as my co-founder. Um, so that was pretty good. That was pretty Very cool. exciting. That's awesome. And then, so how, how's the journey been then from kind of saying, okay, let's get married to kind of where you are now? Uh, so the day, the July, July one, when he was officially the co-founder. Yeah, um, that anniversary, but you have to get your wife's one tattooed on your arm. That's, that's harsh. And there's I know one person who will not be watching this interview should this ever go public. <laughs> See, with the whole my wife and the anniversary thing, I'd stop doing social by Valentine's Day. Beck throws out a post the day before Valentine's Day, day saying, hey, if you've forgotten Valentine's Day, it's not too late. You can buy stuff from Pookie Paul and deliver it straight away. So my wife, Jackie, says to me the next day, you literally put a Facebook post out saying if you've forgotten Valentine's Day. And I go, no, it wasn't me, it was Beck. I was like, you're supposed to take responsibility when it's, that's why I'm no longer the CEO, because I don't want to take your responsibility. Sorry. Anyway. Sorry. Um, you distracted me. What was I talking about? Uh, so how's it been with the, the bromance? Well, July one, suddenly I've, if, any, if, there, if anyone's gone from what I've gone from being solo to having a co-founder, they will understand the feeling that suddenly like, this is just so more real. Yeah. It's like shit just got real. Cause now there's someone who's in the trench with me who I can tell exactly the truth to. And everyone gets the truth, but sometimes you don't volunteer unnecessary information. But with Jules, it's like, you know, everything's an open book. Um, suddenly I've got someone who understands and now over time, like, you know, what are we in now? 10 months in, um, he's not just, uh, the tech guy, he's got some really good business experience as well. And, um, when we disagree, like there's really good discussions, there's really robust discussions about why, um, you know, how is this optimizing the user experience? How is this helping our retailers sell more? Cause that's, if it doesn't help our retailers sell more, then there's gotta be a really good reason for us to be there. Yeah. Um, we've just gone through sort of four months of app development. Um, and obviously not being the tech guy, I've just got to trust that the tech's working, but then we're having discussions about how all that works. So it's been pretty good. We've got a pretty good split. Um, I say he does all the working. I do all the talking, um, which is pretty much how it works out. So that's why I'm talking to you and not him because he's actually working right now doing some react native rubbish. Perfect. Well, that, that it's, it's important part of the business, right? You can have the best idea in the world and the right time in the market, but unless you have the right team driving that, you, you've got no hope of kind of pulling that together. Um, have you yeah. seen other great teams, um, you know, that you know that are being successful? I was really proud of the team at my freight, my old company. Yeah. Um, we had a, a, a process where we just hired good people and then taught them what they needed to know. Okay. Um, so I don't know. It's, I don't want to be, uh, what's it? I don't want to be all 21st century management, but if you want to build a great team, then you've got to build, get awesome people and then let them do their stuff. Yeah. Like at the end of the day, someone sometimes has to make a decision. Like, do we have a red button or a green button? Um, and you make a decision, but you back the, the people who you've empowered to look at. Like you don't hire a UX consultant or a UX person and put them in your team. And then when they say it should be a red button and it should be over here, then tell them, no, it shouldn't be. Cause that's just rubbish. Like, you know, if I knew everything, well, no one knows everything. Um, so I was, I was part of really good teams. And I think I just try and sort of, that I remember everything we did really, really well at my freight and we try and sort of, you know, replicate the feeling about how that felt. How did it feel to make a decision? The, you know, the decisions feel right. How did it feel to listen? How did it feel to disagree? And sort of try and, um, and try and redo that. Oh, I think that's the answer to question. Yeah, no, perfect. Yeah. Thank you. And what, what's the biggest challenge you guys have experienced so far? And what did you learn from it? I hate to be the guy, but the biggest, we've raised $180,000, right? Yeah. But it's not enough yet. And because we sort of raised it over 16 months, it's sort of been a bit of, uh, not trips and drabs, but it's sort of, it's just got us to the next short term milestone. Um, the biggest challenge has been that I spend too much of my time talking to people about um, fundraising. Um, and I said that with all due respect to all the VCs and whatever else, but most of them would agree with me that founders spend too much time worrying about where the money's coming from. Um, Julie and I are both in our forties. I've got five kids. He's got two, both got mortgages. We don't have the luxury of literally bootstrapping it. Um, so the biggest challenge has been sort of, I know this is going to work and I've drunk deeply of the Kool-Aid, um, but getting the data to back that up has been a challenge. So we think we'll get that over the next few months. So I hope to stop talking to anyone about money. So what are the key metrics then that you guys measure? What are your unit economics? Oh, we're about to change them all. So that's a really good thing. Um, so uh, the key metric for us, um, okay. 
So the thing is, key, you, a key metric has to be something that you can control that actually contributes to your success. So it's no good having a number that says we've got five nines uptime if no one cares and that doesn't contribute to success. So our key metrics are around um, our average delivery time is two hours and eight minutes. So we're a business that guarantees a three hour delivery. So it's really important is that we're delivering in less than three hours. Uh, we've only had one delivery that was outside that time and that's because we used our emergency fallback position of another career and they let us down. So there's lessons to be learned in that. So two hours eight is really, really key for us um, because we go, that's important because if we're not delivering in three hours, we don't have a business. Um, now, because we've actually got some passes downloading the app and launching, um, we're looking at things like, you know, downloads. Oh, so I guess the journey for a passer is they download the app. That's great. You downloaded the app. Then they have to sign up. So what percentage of people are signing up? If they're not signing up, why aren't they signing up? Once they sign up, then we still need to validate that they are a real person with a real house or a real address. Yep. So there's another step. So it's a three-step process, which everyone know? out there who knows what I'm doing is saying, oh, my God, Marshall, you're trying to set yourself up to fail with a three-step process. Um, yes, but it's really important that we can trust the people doing the deliveries. So key metric downloads, key metric then sign-ups, key metric act activation. So how do we improve that? Um, obviously, once we start doing deliveries at scale, we'll start talking about it, but it's a bit of a vanity metric. You know, how many deliveries did you do? Um, we could have the world's best delivery company, but unless our customers actually sell some stuff, we won't do any. So don't worry about what you can't control. So I'm not really worried about deliveries as a metric at this stage. Though at some stage I'll J-curve it and we'll be able to show, oh, we, have, we weren't making any revenue and then suddenly we were making, and we doubled. We were 100% month on month growth. You've seen all the slides. Um, yeah, so for us, it's really getting the passes on board, which is what I'm going to be all about this week. That's probably the, the biggest, most important thing to us right now. Yeah, that's fantastic. And what are, do you think the things that you're going to have to really focus on to make sure that that is successful? Like, are you particular tools that you're using or, I don't know, how, you're literally running down the street with posters? <laughs> oh, we've tried everything to recruit passes, um, including um, a, a pop-up in a shopping centre, mm -hmm. um, which was two grand not well spent um flyer deliveries so we delivered 400 flyers and got one person to sign up from that so not a good use of our time um we spent money so before christmas pure baby launched for this before christmas from all the melbourne stores um which was beautiful of them because that's the worst time of year to launch a new delivery service so what we did then is we needed to get a whole bunch of passes in a hurry and we know we spent about a grand just on targeted facebook ads um, and got about 350 people to sign up um, in that one week period. Um, and that's a pretty tight demo. We're only targeting 15 kilometre radius around shopping centres, not every shopping centre, 18 to 45 year old women. Yeah. Um, so we know that if we spend that money, we can get that sort of passer uptake. Um, we can just see how little we can spend uh, to get the passes. Um, we'll, use the, did I mention, we'll use the Channel 7 stuff from last night. Um, how did you get that spot? You know, PR is always an interesting conversation with startups. You know, is it just fluff pieces, but it obviously had a direct impact on your numbers. So how, how did you get it? Um, I, my honest answer to that is I feel we were lucky. Um, if you ask everyone else who knows us, they'll say, oh, that's because you did all the hard work, blah, blah, blah. So you, you found me because I'm, I'm, um, I'm, I'm a terrible self promoter or a really good self promoter. <laughs> Very Depends good. Which side <laughs> um, so the Founder Institute guys, when we did the course, they said that um, no one will ever hear about you if you don't if you're actually not willing to tell your story. So we've been doing things like blogging every fortnight for the last year, um, pushing out a whole bunch of content through LinkedIn, Facebook and whatever else. So we're just making some noise. Um, there's a bit of an echo um, in the startup community that if you get lucky enough or you can make enough noise to get in one, one article on one of the blogs, the other ones will usually pick you up. Um, so one of the startup blogs picked me up when I went to Silicon Valley for a week last year as part of that FI thing. Um, and that got a little bit of noise. Um, that's sort of, what's the word when there's a feedback loop? That's the word. There's a feedback loop, literally a feedback loop. Um, so that got some noise. Then um, a website called The Martech, um, which is M-A-R-T-E-C, yeah. did a top 40 startups in Melbourne. Yeah. They had after pay on the list and us. So that's like, that's, you know, we were in a ridiculous company. Um, that, their website, and I've told them this, I get one to two hits a day on our website from that article that is over a year old. Wow. So their SEO, if you're looking to hire someone from SEO, it's still their guy or girl, because that was just nuts. They just released another one, which is the top 50 startups in Melbourne. We made that list. So I expect now that that will we'll keep getting some traction from that. Um, where else do we get it from? 
Um, I've gotten some logistics magazines, some logistics blogs, just because we're freight and um, freight's a pretty small environment. Um, there's a podcast called the Postal Hub Podcast. Mm. Uh, the guy who runs that loves what we're doing. Um, and he's had me back for two interviews. Um, what else is there? And what do you listen to? As a leader, you've got to keep learning and evolving and so you know what things that you should be testing out next. What do you listen to or read? Or who do you listen to? <laughs> okay, so this is um, an open and honest discussion. I went oh, really, okay. really deep. Real Sorry? It, that is being recorded, just to remind you. <laughs> oh, no, it's, I was, it's still saving. So I went really, really... Not only was I drinking the parcel Kool-Aid for the yeah. first part of the year, but I was also drinking the startup um, uh, environment ecosystem Kool-Aid. So I was going to lots of meetups, lots of uh, people you know, doing stuff and whatever else. And what happened is I suddenly realised after a while I kept talking to same not thing. necessarily the same people, but all the people were saying the same things. Um, and I needed to be out talking to my customers, not necessarily talking to people who are in the same boat as me. Um, and I know that probably sound, I should sound all right. Like I'm a business and I'm trying to sell something to retailers. I need to be out talking to retailers. Yeah. So I sort of stopped doing startup stuff and I stopped listening to startup podcasts. Um, and I stopped reading all the startup, a lot of the startup blogs, um, are funding. That's the main thing. It's got funded, got funded, got funded. Um, and that's not really telling me anything because I know how to get funded. I'm just not very good at it. And, you know, I haven't met the right person at the right time yet. So I sort of stopped doing that. So what do I listen to? An answer question. Lots of mass media. I've gone the other way. Um, lots of mass media. So what are the mass media people talking about? What's reverberating through that? And retail, what like, keeps hitting you? So the Amazon thing, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so I need to be a bit more relevant. So I've stopped. I've actually stopped. Re I've stopped listening to block those sort of things. For yeah. a little um, I've gone back to the more traditional stuff. Um, there's a book called Pitch Anything, which is hands down the best sales book ever written. Yeah. Uh, I'll give you a second to look at that. Sorry? Why do you think it's why? the best one? <laughs> oh, sorry, I missed that. Oh, why do you think it's the best one? The guy, Oren Claff, who wrote it, you've got to pitch anything. If you, you've got to listen to it in Audible for like three bucks. It's really cheap. It's just, it's just different. It's different to whatever tells you, everything that everyone tells you to do. Um, it's about pitching to emotion, not pitching to logic, um, which you talk to enough people, they realize that the, so pitch deck, right? We've all got pitch decks. Um, mine's not very good. Um, but a pitch deck, you're going to send it to someone who said you should talk to this guy. You send the pitch deck, you've got like a minute to capture their attention. Um, and if it looks like everyone else's pitch deck, you won't get in there. So how do you do your pitch deck a little bit different? So it's just stuff. He talks about that sort of stuff. Um, pitch anything is a fascinating study because he has a method. And it's not until about 70 to 80% of the way through the book, you realize that he applies his method to the book. Um, and that as you're going through, he's actually pitching you his method as he's going along. And it's like, oh, now I get it. Uh, so I'm listening to pitch anything again. Um, I'll probably go back into Seven Habits of Highly Effective People again, the Stephen Covey book. Um, that's a really good one to read and revisit because Covey wrote it in his 50s. Mm -hmm. So he wasn't like a guy who thought this might work. He was a guy who could prove it worked. Um, and it's 30 years old now. And it's sort of a nexus point where Stephen Covey distilled everything that happened up to his point and got into one book. And pretty much 90% of the, the productivity literature for the last 30 years has just been a rehash of his work. Yeah. So I think that's a really good one to read. Um, so that's what, oh, the other thing I'm listening to, I know we're going to be off tap. There's an app called BorrowBox that is a library app for audible audio books and ebooks really? and so if you live in australia your local library could well be a member of borrow box you download the app and then you get to read ebooks and audio books for free um, okay. they're like normal library books so you can only have one copy of that audio book out at one time so not everyone can be reading the book um but to be honest i'm actually listening to star wars books at the moment because you get too deep sorry really? Well, why not, right? Take, you're defending the galaxy, the, the logistics and the uh, parcel galaxy. <laughs> no, but it's, I'm actually reading it because they're nothing to do with work yeah. and they're nothing to do with, um, you know, everything that's going on. And it's sometimes it's just that psychological break yeah. to say, okay, okay, now I'm not going to... Perfect. Oh, people have their experience. You go to bed and bed's yeah. like the last, the brain suddenly goes, oh, these are all the things that you did wrong today and these are all the things that are going to go wrong tomorrow. Like, seriously, we had the Channel 7 thing last night. It wasn't until 6.26 and it actually started that I relaxed and said, okay, it's definitely going to be on. Yeah. Because I thought, what happens if 
you know, the Americans are bombing Syria. What happens if something really bad happens and we get bumped? Yeah. And I've got people here at a launch party to come and watch nothing. Um, so it was, I was losing sleep over that. And it's like done right because I couldn't do anything to influence whether or not the Americans are going to bomb Syria. Yeah, 100%. So awesome. mental health in the startup space is a, is a big issue that actually doesn't get spoken about a lot. So how, how do you give yourself headspace? So reading Star Wars books, what, what else do you do? Uh, five kids. Yeah. <laughs> um, kids are fascinating. Um, anyone who has been a child or is one or has them is kids don't care about what just happened or what's going to happen at Chris, except for Christmas and birthdays. But kids are like little Zen Buddhist masters. So they absolutely live in the moment. So I will take my daughter to the zoo and she will say, this is the best day of my life. And she's five because for her, it's the best day of her life because she can't really remember what happened two days ago. Um, so kids, and I've got uh, a five month old daughter and a five year old daughter and then three teenage boys. Um, and all of them require um, some space of time where if I'm thinking about anything else, I'm going to miss something really, really important. Like with the teenage boys, it could be something really important, and really bad, but with the daughter, it could be, um, you know, you, one day she couldn't roll over and the next day she could roll, she could roll over. That's like really, really exciting. Uh, so a bit of that, I'm supposed to be exercising, but I haven't been cause you know, I'm staying up too late and whatever else. Oh, Netflix. That's how I take my mind off stuff. Netflix should be called niche flicks because there is absolutely something for everyone. Yeah. I, just, I just fully binged the original Star Trek series, like oh, all 57 episodes or whatever it is. Anyway, so it's good to do that. Sorry. What window did you do that over? Oh, sleep's overrated. Don't, don't believe all the new age. You've got to have eight hours sleep a night. Rubbish. You can get up at 5.30 if you've gone to bed at 11.30. That's six hours sleep. That's plenty. So, but also um, my baby's, um, my wife's still breastfeeding, obviously. So she's going to bed early so she can get up two or three times a night. Yeah. So I'm she goes to bed, I get to watch like one episode of Star Trek or something. <laughs> Fair enough. So no negotiations then. Um, so I ask everyone this question. If you could have a superpower, what would it be and why? I already have a superpower, Jen. My superpower is I always get good parking spots. <laughs> no, don't worry about it. If you and I, when I'm in Sydney and we go out and we go out somewhere and we don't Uber it because we've got to start up. When, if I, we've been in a parking spot, I will get you a parking spot. And it's always a good parking spot. So I'm that's my superpower. I'll hold you to that. <laughs> yeah, that so if I had another one, I don't want to be greedy. If I had another superpower, that's a really good question. Um, maybe teleportation. Yeah. So the physical ability for me to not be in the one place, two places at the same time, but to be somewhere else really, really quickly and not lose that. So I live in Frankston, yeah. um, which is... 45 kilometers out of the CBD um, and it's Melbourne. So every, everyone else is in Melbourne or Richmond, which is basically an hour away. Um, so I'm either on the train working um, or in the car listening to Star Wars novels. Um, so Star Trek and Star Wars if teleportation is your thing, right? Cause you know, all I'm thinking about is coming up to the uh, spaceship. Yeah. Yeah. But I probably just find time to read maybe more by being in my place. That's a good point. No, teleportation would be my superpower. Awesome. If I was to add one to my ability to always get a good parking spot. You should get a, like a cape or something so people realise you have one. <laughs> I'm, wearing a startup. I'm wearing a sleeveless vest and a black t-shirt. People know I've got a startup here. Startup. All right. Well, thank you so much. Really appreciate your time. Good luck with the rest of um, or the year with your startup and um, look forward to keeping you in contact. Thank you very much, Jane. Really appreciate it. See ya.